position. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I will be splitting my time with the member for Megantiklerabla today. Speaker, this week, for the first time since its passage, the Emergencies Act has been invoked by the Prime Minister. This is historic and it is extremely disappointing. The Prime Minister has invoked the Act, he says, to deal with the protests that have gathered here in downtown Ottawa and blockades that were happening at the Coutts border in Alberta, the Emerson border in Manitoba, the Ambassador Bridge in Windsor and the border at Surrey, all of which by the way, are now open. There are no more blockades at any borders. What's left are the trucks parked outside here in Ottawa that need to move or be moved. However, throughout the last three weeks, the Prime Minister has failed to take meaningful action to de-escalate the protests here or use any tools that he may have available. Instead, he has jumped straight to the most extreme measure. And as he has invoked the Act, he has failed to meet the high threshold set out by the Emergencies Act to justify it. That being, and I quote, when a situation seriously threatens the ability of the Government of Canada to preserve the sovereignty, security and territorial, territorial integrity of Canada, and when the situation cannot be effectively dealt with under any other law of the country. Conservatives do not believe the government has shown that threshold has been met, and thus we will be voting against it. Keep in mind, keep in mind, Mr. Speaker, this act is already invoked and is the new law of the land. Our debate and the vote on Monday can only stop it if the NDP vote with Conservatives and the Bloc to stop it. one of the most serious decisions a parliamentarian can make. I want to remind especially the NDP of this, who are supporting the Liberals in this sledgehammer approach. History will not be kind to the leader of the NDP or his members on this particular question. The Emergencies Act, the Emergencies Act predecessor, the War Measures Act, was only used three times. World War I, World War II and the FLQ crisis. Colleagues, we should keep these precedents in mind. The weight of those events should caution us against making this decision lightly. These protests have caused disruptions for many Canadians, especially local businesses and residents of Ottawa. As I have said, Conservatives are the party of law and order. We believe the trucks should move or be moved. to lower the temperature across the country. The Prime Minister clearly wants to raise it. Let's be very clear how this all started. The Prime Minister decided to impose a vaccine mandate on truckers with no scientific evidence that it was the right thing to do. Many Canadians opposed it, but he went ahead anyway. Truckers and millions of Canadians felt they had no recourse with this Prime Minister. And who can blame them? After all, this was the Prime Minister who called them racist and misogynist. He said their views were unacceptable, that they were on the fringe. And when truckers and their supporters arrived in Ottawa, what did the Prime Minister do first? He hid for a week and then he continued his insults, calling them and anyone who supported them or even talked with them things like Nazi supporters. We saw that name-calling and unfair and mean-spirited characterization happen just yesterday, Mr. Speaker, by the Prime Minister of Canada in this House. That is all he has done to rectify the problem, call names and insult. Mr. Speaker, many of the people that are protesting, many of the people who are upset are our neighbours. They are our constituents. They are Canadians. And they want to be heard and given even just a little respect by their Prime Minister. But the Prime Minister has decided that because he, dis he disagrees with them, doesn't like their opinions, he won't hear them. At every turn, the Prime Minister has stigmatised, wedged, divided and traumatised Canadians. And now, without even a single meeting with a trucker, without talking through one of their concerns, without apologizing for his insults and listening to what people have to say, without using any other tool at his disposable, disposal, he has used this overreach, this Emergencies Act, and it's wrong. The Prime Minister's leadership in this situation has frankly been abysmal. 
He said this week, and I quote, invoking the Emergencies Act is never the first thing, thing a government should do, or even the second. The act has to be used sparingly and as a last resort. But his actions have so, shown the opposite approach. The so-called measure of last resort has come before taking any action to address the frustrations at the root of the protest. How did the Prime Minister go directly from ignoring the truckers to turning the, into this to the Emergencies Act? Why has the government jumped straight to this without doing anything to lower the temperature first? Conservatives put forward a reasonable approach that could help bring the temperature down and address the concerns. We asked the government to commit publicly to a specific plan and timeline to roll back federal mandates and restrictions. But the Liberals and NDP refused to support our plan, and instead the Prime Minister reached for more power. This comes as provincial governments are announcing plans to end COVID-19 restrictions. The Prime Minister is an exception to this trend and he refuses to come forward with a plan. Even the provinces are unhappy with the Prime Minister for doing this. Alberta, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, Quebec, Nova Scotia, they're all opposed to the use of the Emergencies Act. This is not a good look for the Prime Minister. We all want the trucks here in Ottawa to move. We want a peaceful and quick end to the trucks blocking the streets in Ottawa. Our message to those protesting is still this. Conservatives have heard you. We will keep standing up for you. But it's time to move the trucks. At the same time, the government should resort, no government should resort to the kind of extreme measures that we're seeing. Unfortunately, the Prime Minister has a track record of serious disregard for the law and that raises a lot of red flags. This is the Prime Minister who interfered with an ongoing criminal trial in the SNC-Lavalin scandal. This is a Prime Minister who took the Speaker to court instead of fulfilling his legal obligation to provide documents to this Parliament. On two separate occasions, this is the Prime Minister who has been found guilty by the Ethics Commissioner. This Prime Minister admired, admitted his basic admiration for basic dictatorships. Red flag after red flag after red flag. He may not like it, Mr. Speaker, but in Canada, civil liberties must be defended at every turn. Section 2 guarantees our freedom of association and assembly. Section 7 guarantees our right to life, liberty and security of the person. Section 8 guarantees our protection against unreasonable search and seizure. Canadians can't be expected to simply take this Prime Minister at his word. His plans are not consistent with fundamental freedoms. The government should not have the power to close the bank accounts of Canadians on a whim. The Prime Minister is doing this to save his own political skin, but Mr. Speaker, this is not a game. It comes at the cost to Canadians' rights and freedoms. Speaker, Parliament should not allow the Prime Minister to avoid responsibility in this way. I urge all members of this House, proceed with extreme caution. Now is the time to stand up for your constituents, to show real leadership, to help heal our divisions, to listen to those we disagree with, to not shut them down, to not tell them that they are irrelevant, to not speak insults to them. That is the job of each one of us as members of Parliament. No matter who we represent, we have to represent them with integrity, with hope, with honour. And what the Prime Minister is doing, Mr. Speaker, he has for the last two years disregarded these Canadians, called them names and insulted them. It is time to show leadership for every one of us.